Welcome everyone to another discussion with experts in areas of digital and online learning as part of the Pivot Online Open Course. Uh, today I'm privileged to meet with a uh, colleague and friend, Professor Kate Bowles. Kate, it's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, George. Um, thanks for inviting me. I work at a regional Australian university and my role at the moment is um, I'm an Associate Dean for International Matters in a faculty that deals with law, humanities and arts. So not for the whole university, but a governance role in that faculty. Um, I've been teaching online since the mid 1990s. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, and because of that, I was involved for a while in the governance of EdTech at our university, the governance of um, educational design and particularly LMS evaluation and, and purchase. Uh, but now my governance role is to do with international students and internationalization. And, and boy, that, that these days that must be uh, an enormous uh, task given how much the international student population, in addition to everyone, is being impacted by what's going on with COVID. Uh, crises, I imagine. Look, these young people who travel um, not just to become international students, but also study abroad and mobility students who are all caught up in this, yeah. they have gone through extraordinary disruption to their expectations and their plans for this year. Um, we have so many students who had only just arrived at the place where they were expecting um, to spend a semester and they had to go immediately home, particularly to the United States, where it was too late for them to study anything. So they're now attempting to study remotely in Australia, which is very far from the expectation that they had of, of this time. They thought that they would be at the beach and making lifelong friends, and they're back home in their bedroom. Yeah, well. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really complicated portfolio to work in right at this moment. So one of the things I've always loved about your uh, work and specific, uh, specifically your public scholarship, because I think you, you, uh, you really focus on what is the experience of being human, how does technology and the related structures around us influence and impact that. And that's something that, that you do graciously and with a degree of authenticity that, that you don't find often online. And I've always loved that about your work. Now, one of the points that as we were preparing for this, you made this, this point that, you know, there's a creative energy cycle in, you know, that was coming along in the, in the 90s and even as the early 2000s. But, you know, online education at that time, it was about just being thrilled and exciting. And it, it wasn't about market share and cost efficiency and, and all these other things. It was about just this, this momentum of new and exciting and different ways of connecting and so on. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and how that differs from say the climate we're in right now, which is driven by marketization and a lot of other less than pleasant concepts sometimes for students and teachers? Yeah, sure. Look, when I, when I first started exploring ways to use what was then the technology to put students in one place together with students at another place, I was really influenced by a book that came out in 1994. The US philosopher Mark C. Taylor uh, put together his class of philosophy students with a class of philosophy students in Finland. Uh, he found a colleague who wanted to do this and they mostly did it on email. And these two philosophers published a, a pretty hefty book about the experience and I was really gripped by this account of, of what two groups of people finding each other through email had found to talk about in relation to media philosophy. It's, it's still the most beautiful, most influential book. And I think that meant that I started my journey with all of this thinking very much about just people. What, what happens when you make it possible for people to connect with people that they wouldn't meet in their every day, that wouldn't be sitting next to them on the bus? how would that expand their educational horizon? So now that I'm in an internationalization role, I realized I was in an internationalization role then. That was what I was interested in. And the technology was just what made it possible. Um, what I think has happened since then, there were lots of us doing it, um, using, you know, internet relay chat, um, ICQ, all sorts of things. Um, what I think changed abruptly was the LMS arrived. And the LMS took all of this 
kind of wild activity and brought it inside a territory. And the territory was password protected and owned and it was almost immediately about content and not about people. Because as soon as you had a platform, you had a thing you could put things on and then you had to have the things. And then the pedagogy flipped quickly towards content. And, you know, before we know where we are, if you've got content, you've got to have learning outcomes. And if you've got learning outcomes, well, you know what comes next, learning analytics. And by the time we had got to learning analytics, we had really lost our way, I think. Yeah, and that's, uh, it's interesting from that, that lens. I mean, I, I've been involved in learning analytics, and I think you and I probably have a, a, a dramatically different opinion on, on the role of learning analytics, but I think your, I, your assessment is fair about how the wild openness of the pre- or the early internet days ended up becoming severely constrained with the arrival of an LMS and the, the, the subsequent arrival, once you have an LMS in the environment, then all of a sudden you have a completely different way of interacting. It's the, the richness and the vigor of the space is done. Like the ecology becomes quarantined and blocked off and the free range roaming animals are kept out so to speak. And that can be sometimes a good thing. I, I respect that. But it also places, it, it makes a markedly different experience. Uh, it becomes not, not the same vital knowledge space. Instead, it becomes a space of planned performance, which has a lot less of the vitality that the other environment did. And yes, it ends up becoming about learning outcomes, learning content, and learning analytics is not far behind. And, and a broader question, I know you're well acquainted with this, or you think about this often, is the marketization of education, the changing priorities that we focus on to think about money, to think about recruitment, to think about all kinds of other things that really traditionally haven't been the primary role of faculty to do, or even a university, but now are. So how, how, do, we, how do we make the university a slightly less marketed place in this forced online? I'm not sure that we can. Um, so I want to kind of come back to why that is. Um, first of all, the, the thing that I want to say about the, where we are now is that actually we couldn't be coping with the crisis that we're in now if all of that infrastructure that made the wild uh, more contained, if all of that infrastructure wasn't developed. Um, the, the wild would not have served us in this crisis as, as the tamed has served us. Um, so the market, uh, I think one of the things that happened once everyone had LMS exposure and sometimes an LMS of their own is that the most powerful players in this market situation were able to prospect and see a bunch of people that didn't seem to have content. Well, they can have ours, we can sell them that. Um, they didn't seem to have this, the learning structure, we could sell them that, and we could pack credentials with that. So this is 2012. This is uh, what happened then with MOOCs. Um, and what we saw was a, um, a hustle, a, a, a giant hustle. And I think for many of us outside the United States, watching this giant hustle behave in the way that colonialism always behaves, this was not, a, not the novelty that the um, MOOC providers in 2012 were claiming that it was. It was absolutely history repeating itself. Um, can we do something about marketization now? Will we emerge from this crisis having perhaps let go of some of our more unsavory behaviors in relation to education as a product? That's very hard to predict because uh, the downturn in student enrollment, uh, particularly in international student enrollment, has thrown universities into a business crisis. So certainly here in Australia, there is very public discussion of the possibility of widespread job losses. And this is related to a, a market problem that we couldn't have foreseen. Will the market repair itself? Uh, will capitalism heal itself? It's really hard to predict um, under these circumstances. Uh, and I, I think for educators who are trying to think about how to preserve a pedagogy of care, 
under this kind of slightly hectic situation that we find ourselves in, I think it's very hard to know how to practice a pedagogy of care in, in this state of market anxiety, market distress. Um, that's, that's not an answer to your question. It's kind of why we can't just simply say yes, no. Yeah. Well, and one thing I like about the, the response that you provided is that you're, you're recognizing that LMS has changed the experience of the learning process in a dramatic way, and it tames much of what makes it fun and exhilarating. By the same account, it would be very hard to teach right now if you didn't have some kind of centralized contained structure where you can bring in hundreds, thousands of faculty in some institution who have no clue what a blog is, have no clue how to interact in social uh, technology spaces. So it's, and I'm, I appreciate that you see those tensions, recognize those tensions, but still have a sense of you're lamenting something that is still lost in this stage. And it's always the lessons you learn from a crisis. Sometimes you don't, it's like you don't want to make decisions when you're in the middle of a, you know, crisis or let's say a relationship breakdown. That's not the time to decide that you want to enlist in a cruise to Antarctica, for example. You, you want to wait until you're, so I think at a similar level, we Thank should be, cruises. learn lessons here, but we should be cautious about the technology related lessons that we learn because this isn't a normal cycle. But there's two final things I just briefly want to address. You just addressed culture of care, and I'm going to pick that up right at the end. But one of the, the uh, challenges that a, a lot of students are facing, and this is your area of work with the international uh, student population, is this idea of home, identity, relationship, government care for us. Uh, there are, some governments haven't been great at ensuring just a sense of humanity and care, because when an international student is here, for all intents and purposes, they are home. This is their home for the next year or two years or whatever else. And some governments haven't been overwhelmingly welcoming in that regard. But what are some of your thoughts on the, the spacedness of home as an international student and what the current COVID crisis is doing to that? Look, I, I have the extraordinary fortune of working directly with international students. And where I am, they're very active in uh, reflecting and researching this situation that they find themselves in. Um, I was speaking yesterday with a student who has um, taken some care to hang behind where you meet her in a meeting of this kind, something that really represents her feelings about her home country. So that when you meet her, you meet her, as it were, more at home than you would if you met her in your office or in a conventional classroom. And I think that this is revealing something to universities about the international students that we've had with us all along, that they have always also had homes in our communities. Um, and they've come into our classrooms stripped of that. We haven't known this about them. And I think that provided we can keep our international students safe and sufficiently cared for, and we can see that in Australia, this is something that the government is completely failing to do. If we can keep our Australian students cared for, uh, international students cared for, I think they will produce some very rich ethnographic material from this time. They will speak about this home predicament that they find themselves in. Uh, we have to be very good at listening. Uh, to this to this conversation that they're attempting to have with us about their sense of belonging, um, which is often very strong. So, so that's what I think about that, is that in a funny way, the, uh, the technologies, the platforms, the meeting technologies that we're using are taking us into different kinds of home spaces with each other. Um, you're in my home. This is my house. And all week, students have been in this house as it were, with me. And I think that's doing something at quite a profound human level that maybe the classroom, the face-to-face -face classroom isn't doing. So I'm interested to see, and I don't yet know what I will see, I'm interested to see what happens as a result of this. And that's a very insightful and considered experience on the role of students. When 9-11 happened uh, you know, in the US, we had a number of planes that were grounded in Canada. and. A moment of crisis can be incredibly affirming to the best of people. 
just like a moment of crisis can also raise concerns about what kind of society have we become when you see uh, abnormal behavior. But uh, that experience, and I, and I love that focus that these students, they're observing us, they're participating with us, they're telling us what they need. And when they go back to their countries and how they think about Australia, US, Canada, UK, wherever, when they do return, is going to be a function of how they were treated. Did they feel like they were homed? in their uh, foreign country for, that they were visiting for that period of time, or did they feel rejected, isolated, and, and almost discarded? Which brings yeah. me to the yeah. final question I'd love to hear more about from you is, and just before we had this discussion, we talked about a few different things, and you brought up the urgency of really that care, that we, we as uh, people, when you can do so much wrong in the online environment, there are so many challenges you face, student dis being disappointed because they paid to be in a physical campus, they were looking forward to that time on the beach and whatever else, and now all of a sudden, that's not a reality. They're disappointed. Teachers are overwhelmed. Support staff are overwhelmed. University leadership is facing a daunting financial crisis, and the list goes on. Sometimes the best you can do when everything is falling apart and technology is not working, everybody's disappointed, is the concept that, uh, that you referenced earlier, which is culture of care. What is that? And can you explain how someone moving into the online environment can keep that centered in front of their work? I think to me, the, what I've observed in this period when we suddenly all went home and we all went online is that faculty, on the one hand, have been massively exposed to the thinking of executive and administration decision making, which is happening at a fast pace. So faculty who, who may previously have largely focused on doing their teaching and their research are now exposed to the thinking of governance, and that's very stressful. Um, all of us are working for institutions that are changing their minds week by week about what is possible because our institutions are responding to government and government is spinning. So faculty become exhausted and stressed with uh, all of this. On the other side, students are getting an even more third hand message about what's happening this week and what's likely to happen next week. And they're getting what can sometimes seem to them like a shambles of um, arrangements, uh, unclear communications, communications that directly contradict other communications. And so they're becoming understandably testy. And certainly in Australia, a lot of students are also dealing with financial stress, rent stress, they're dealing with welfare. And um, under these circumstances, it's very easy to forget the human standing in front of you is just a person trying to do their best probably having made some mistakes in the way they communicated. I think that this is a time, this is a time for faculty particularly, if we have the resources to respond slowly, to respond really carefully, always to think, when I write this, is it too long? We're, we're notorious for saying too much in an email or a Moodle post or whatever it is. Is it too long? Can it be understood by someone who can barely hold themselves together with duct tape? Does it have enough visual content for the people who really need to see it diagrammed? Um, have I made it easy and possible in multiple different ways for someone who is distressed to know that I respect their distress and this is how to contact me? So in a very practical way, when you're um, working online, you need to leave at multiple points because students always find things in different ways and in different places. Here's how you contact me. If you've reached this point and you're upset by anything, here's how you contact me. And you can't say that too many times. And then when you said, here's how you contact me, you also have to recognize that sometimes someone who contacts you is not being their best self in that moment. Um, and probably the third thing, therefore, about a culture of care about, and, and I realize here, George, what I'm talking about is a culture of care in communication, specifically. When you're trying to communicate with care, the third thing is always self-care. You, you have to be understanding that sometimes you will see and read things that hurt your feelings, that make you feel 
indignant or misunderstood or that nobody can see how hard you're working. And at that point, I think uh, we should be reaching out to each other. Um, I have trusted people that I go to online when I feel stung and I can go and say, this little thing happened and it really got to me and I know it shouldn't have got to me, but it did. Self-care is, is key here to getting through this. We are experiencing as a profession extraordinary widespread disruption that is leading to extraordinary levels of fatigue. We are already exhausted and our students are already exhausted. So the, I think that the care focus is not on pedagogy, but communication, uh, being very, very careful about how we speak. Well, and that's a great note on which to, to end the discussion here. And I do you know, agree that, that the culture of care and, and some of the ability to reach out you know, for teachers or faculty who are listening to this particular conversation as well, who do you go to and do you have a network or a system built where you can do the uh, pressure valve release before you have to do the full on blow up, which is often not pretty and you say and do things that you may not mean to and everybody exactly like you noted, the students have heightened stress, the administrators have heightened stress, support staff do, if you do as a, as a teacher or faculty in the online environment and having some ability to recognize and be conscious of it and, and release the pressure at a certain stage before it becomes something more significant is, is, a, is very sage advice. Uh, Kate, as always, it's a delightful pleasure to have uh, taken the opportunity to chat with with you and I hope you have a great rest of your day.